Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I started in February, so this is a golden opportunity for me to showcase the research that I'm doing to hopefully initiate some new collaborations within the department and also externally. So please feel free to approach me after the session and I will be happy to discuss uh, potential collaborations. I'll be talking to you about solution process semiconductors, uh, namely in the form of perovskites and other types of nanomaterials that we work with, uh, with the intention to use them for photovoltaics or solar cells. So some of you may be familiar with some of these charts, but uh, essentially solar got really cheap. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, we need to deploy a lot of these panels in order to reach our renewable energy targets. So it's important that they are cheap and affordable. Um, you can see that now that if you look at your electricity bill, you'll see that we're paying something like uh, 25 uh, pence per kilowatt hour. Uh, solar and wind are both cheaper than fossil fuels now. So we're all good on that front. If you look at that chart down the bottom, you can clearly see that. Some of these values are actually based on American numbers, so I've tried to convert them to um, uh, pounds as I speak. Um, Solar's expansion plans are quite, uh, uh, have done exceptionally well. Um, so, for instance, we're now on target to hit what we need to be at in, by 2050, uh, which means that we typically need to get around three to five uh, terawatts per year on annual production. And we're very, very uh, much on the way to hitting that, which would lead to that sort of 75 to 80 terawatts by 2050. So we're all good on that front. And you're probably wondering, if solar's doing so well, why am I standing here? Well. That's typically based on our established technologies like silicon uh, that have done a wonderful job over the past 50 years in, in becoming very efficient. Um, and it's also contributed to some of the work with sort of your cadmium telluride more, uh, cells, which are pictured in the, in the bottom left. But what I'll be talking to you about today is more of these emerging technologies, which are namely based around these perovskite absorber materials, which can be implemented very, very easily into flexible systems, which can be then mounted into hard to reach places. For instance, there has been uh, a, a, a kind of a steady uh, flat line for silicon's progress since, 20, since the 2000s up until sort of where we are now. The laser point is really hard to see uh, from here, but uh, I will just read it off. Um, essentially, this is the progress or the blue line of how far silicon's come over 50 years. So it's made good progress. If you look at the emerging technologies based on perovskite, they've made very, very quick progress. And actually now, in the form of a tandem solar cell, which is basically a multi-junction solar cell, they're now exceeding 34% in efficiency. This is huge, and this is gonna be the, the, at the blueprint for making the, the future of emerging technologies such as these perovskite systems for renewable energy. So I mentioned the word perovskite. What is perovskite? So traditionally, it's calcium titanate. This is a mineral that we can find in the ground. But of course, in this form, it's actually not a semiconductor. The ones that work quite well as semiconductors are those based on germanium, tin, or lead halides. Um, actually, the first report on these types of semiconductors was back in 1892. So it's not a new material discovery. They've been around for a very long time. And actually, people started to go beyond the periodic table and incorporate organic sites like methyl ammonium uh, in 1978. So it's been around for many, many years. Actually, it took over 100 years for them to actually start to be used in solar cells or PV. In 2009, there was a first uh, breakthrough where they actually integrated these absorber materials into a solar cell, which was around 3.8% efficiency. Within de one decade, they already surpassed 25%. So this is just a remarkable advance in the field. You can very quickly see, you know, it's quite interesting to think what other materials are out there that we can discover to push the barriers even further to make society greener, more sustainable, and actually much more cost effective than what we're currently doing. So some of the materials that we work with uh, are based around uh, quantum confined materials, so perovskite quantum dots. We also have worked in the past with indium phosphide systems or your uh, cadmium telluride, cadmium selenide. But with the perovskites, um, what we can do is we can engineer their composition to emit at certain wavelengths. And this opens up what we call a halide playground because we're able to then say, okay, if we want a material that emits in the UV, if we want something that emits in the near IR, we just need to know what composition to make. And it's very, very straightforward. Uh, they can then be implemented into LEDs, solar cells, or other types of applications. And just to demonstrate how simple they are to make, I put a video up of, from one of my students who's now rapidly injecting a solution of lead bromide into a solution of um, cesium carbonate. And you can see that within about 10 seconds, we've got uh, quantum dots which are emitting um, very, very brightly. They have a PLQI of about 90%. So when I was a PhD student, 
if I was to see this, I was going to be like, full off my chair. Like the amount of work that I had to do to get a 90% quantum yield on an indium phosphide quantum dot was, was a lot of processing, okay? Complex chemical techniques, these are all out the window now. We can do this on a bench. Anyone in this room can do that. That is stirring at room temperature without any heat, without any nitrogen protection. It's just a very basic reaction. There's a number of ways you can do that. There's also a number of ways that we can make these polycrystalline films. So for those who are familiar with silicon, know that it exists in a polycrystalline form, which is less efficient than the monocrystalline variation. But these perovskites can actually be made um, very efficiently and very effectively as a polycrystalline thin film. And I'm going to show you exactly how my lab does that. So uh, we first need to make a semiconductor ink solution. This is based around uh, typically a lead iodide and a former medinium iodide precursor. So these are just a white powder, a yellow powder. We mix it in with some solvent and you end up with a solution which is kind of a yellow color. At the, we, then, we then apply it to a substrate which is usually a conducting TCO such as uh, indium tin oxide. And we would then start to spin coat it onto, a, onto our uh, surface. During the spin coating process, we add what we call an anti-solvent. The anti-solvent effectively induces nucleation and uh, reduces the solubility of the first solution that we added as our ink. And what you can see is after that anti-solvent is added, simply by dropping uh, with a syringe, um, quite crude to be honest, um, can be done very easily. And as you can see, in a minute, the student will lift up the lid and remove that film. And you'll end up with a semi-sort of transparent film of the perovskite uh, layer. So what you can see there, it actually hasn't formed the full perovskite yet, I should say. So at this point, we then heat it to 100 degrees, and after about 10 minutes, you actually fully form your polycrystalline perovskite layer, which is this jet black color here. This absorbs light extremely efficiently. And then you can do a number of processing things. You can either um, co-evaporate your charge transport layers, or you can even do things such as what I like to call scotch tape assisted doctor blading, which is you can literally take a piece of um, scotch tape, put some holes in it as your mask, and then apply a, a paste of carbon, which you can buy from Alibaba for about one pound, over the top of your substrate, and you end up with these fingers of, of carbon electrodes, which are down the bottom right. And the process is literally, as I said, you just take a microscope slide and, and wipe it across your, your mask, and that's it. You have your solar cell. These are about 20% efficient, and that's all done uh, relatively easily. You don't have any high temperature processing and other things. So there's a number of variations we can do here. This is kind of a simple example, but that's sort of uh, one of the common things that's been done in my lab. So over the past four years, uh, we've published a, a range of papers. Um, I'm not going to go through everything here, but I did want to highlight some of the work that may be interesting to other academics and also externals, is that uh, we also work quite a lot with flexible systems. So here is a solar module, which is about 1.6 meters long, of an integrated perovskite system, which we are working with teams in Germany on, on, on building up further. So we've got a paper in review at the moment, so hopefully uh, that comes out quite soon. Um, I've already worked quite extensively with groups in Tripoli, specifically Yanis, uh, with solar light concentrators, so there's plenty of room to build that further, and I've really got my arms open to work with new academics in Tripoli uh, with a variety of applications which we can hopefully complement. Um, other electronic applications include uh, some work we've done on perovskite single crystals. I haven't shown how we make those, but we can also do that. Uh, so we're already working with Jeff Thornton in the LCN, and we've had a few papers come out uh, on those uh, for some photochemical uh, processings. But this kind of leads me to what the group's doing now, and where we're sort of at, where we want to target our applications, and, and where the future of all this technology will lie. And if you think of the solar spectrum and where silicon absorbs, uh, you can see that there are actually quite a number of photons that are wasted. So we've got high energy photons wasted, which is indicated on the um, top side there. On the lower side, you can see we actually also have a limit. We, we are uh, absorbing uh, less of the low energy photons. So these are otherwise wasted. So what we can actually do is form these multi-junction solar cells, which are able to, we can pair with something like silicon, which has a narrow band gap as our bottom cell, which is indicated with the black kind of square on the top right. We can then couple that with a wide band gap perovskite layer. So when I mentioned before this halide playground, that applies to all the processing techniques. So we can make polycrystalline thin films which have band gaps anywhere from 1.7 EV up to 2.4. And this also opens up windows for indoor, photo, photo, uh, sorry, indoor electronics as well for absorbing you know, 1,000 lux and things like that, which would require a, a band gap of probably 2.3 EV. We can do that. That's all through solution processing. 
So an example of what it looks like is uh, here you'd have a, a kind of a, a a stack cell where you'd have your silicon on the bottom, which would be your narrow band gap uh, absorber, and then on top of it you'd have your, your perovskite, which would be your wider band gap. And what you're doing there is you're able to couple those things together so that you can actually utilize higher voltages and in turn, of course, higher efficiencies. This is exactly how those, uh, when I showed that chart before, the um, peak performance is now 34%. So uh, if we consider a, a renewable future, we need to think about how much land mass we need to cover. If this technology can improve the efficiency from 25% from up to 34 within a couple of years, it's really, really something impressive. And this is going to have a significant role in the future design of how solar cells are deployed uh, across the world. So more, very much more specifically now, we'll talk about some of the work that my students uh, are working on. So my first PhD student, Nicole, is actually giving a poster on this. So if you want to go um, find out a bit more, please see her at uh, 036. Um, she's actually working on narrow band gap systems, now uh, narrow band gap perovskites, I should say. Uh, in this sense, we've actually replaced the silicon with a perovskite because, like I said, we've got this halide playground, so we're able to use a wide band gap perovskite on top and narrow band gap on the bottom, and we're then able to make these uh, really uh, quite efficient devices. Now, what we're focusing predominantly on here is the absorber layer itself. Um, I showed a very basic video of the, the film fabrication before, but actually to make these tin lead systems, it's a bit more complicated um, and it requires a bit more work. So um, that's what she's working on. She's looking into more of the photonic processes which, under, which, which happen when you crystallize these films. So uh, she's already ob ob obtained very high uh, quantum yields for a steady state, um, steady state film. And now we're sort of looking at more into how we can improve the emission more so that we can get them to work better in, in solar cells. We've already got some preliminary data which shows around 20, almost 23%. The world record for these are about is 23.8. So we're not far away from hitting that mark uh, here at UCL. Um, and a little bit of a different spin, we also do operando photoluminescence measurements. So in a, I guess that the easiest way to explain this is we would take our solar cell and we would then uh, measure, it, uh, measure the photoluminescence at different voltages. What this is, enables us to do is it enables us to understand a little bit more about the quasi-fermi level splitting. So essentially what we want to know here is what is happening to the, ch the, the charge carrier density within the perovskite. So these kind of photophysical things can all be set up uh, quite uh, sort of as a straightforward setup, and we basically are doing that in 906, where we essentially set up our solar cell within the spectrometer, we apply a bias, and we can sweep our voltages. And the nice thing here is that we can then remap our JV curve from our photoluminescence spectroscopy. You can see here in the bottom left, a JV curve is a typical way that you would characterize your solar cell, so you would sweep a voltage, measure a current, and you can remap that just from the PL spectra. So this is sort of what we're working towards there, and we're uh, hoping to publish this uh, quite, uh, quite soon. But it's really about the fundamentals and understanding what's happened to the charge carrier density and how we can make it more efficient. I'm going to take a, a bit of a left turn now and talk about uh, phosphorine nanoribbons. So this is another solution process nanomaterial that we work with. Um, for those who are not familiar, think of graphene. Graphene nanoribbons revolutionized the field a few years ago, and they've been used in a variety of applications. But phosphorine nanoribbons are a material which people uh, struggled to make for a very, very long time. And they've been predicted to be very, very effective uh, for a range of electronic applications. In 2019, a colleague over in physics, Chris Howard, uh, came up with a production method to make these nanoribbons. Um, so that was published uh, a couple of years ago, and ever since that paper, we've been working together on how we can get these ribbons into devices and study their optical electronics. My, first PhD, my second PhD student, Harry, is actually working on this production right now, and uh, we've basically are trying to expand on what we've already published on the efficient charge extraction using nanoribbons. Here was the first ever example of uh, phosphorine nanoribbons in optical electronics, and we were able to definitively prove that they enhance charge extraction within our optical electronic device. Um, just briefly, I've got a couple of, maybe a minute. Um, the, these nanoribbons are also being made in different ways. So I heard someone mentioning uh, working with arsenic before, so it's good to say I'm not the only one. But we actually use, uh, we dope these nanoribbons with arsenic and other types of materials such as antinomy to further probe their parameters in terms of getting more uh, mobility out of the nanomaterial itself and getting the charge extraction to work more efficiently. So this is work that my postdoc is working on, but we are already sort of pushing the boundaries to where we can get these single junction, single junction cells to work with these novel nanomaterials. 
So um, we engineer nanomaterials to suit a range of renewable energy applications. Uh, we couple photoluminescent spectroscopy with electronics to be able to learn more about charge extraction. This is Operando PL. We then employ novel nanomaterials to discover the origin of performance enhancement. And this is with the hope that we can um, learn a little bit more about how devices operate and how we can make them better to in turn make things like much more efficient modules. So I'll acknowledge everybody on the slide and thank you for your attention. Um, also, um, it's, it's you know, been a great event and thank you to all the admin staff for all your hard work in organizing it. Thank you, John. Perfectly for time. We, we, have, we have time for one or two questions. Would anyone like to ask? Polina. Yeah, I, I, please forgive me. I don't know much about this, but are they not like, a bit like salt, perovskites? They melt, they're soluble. Uh, so in, we, we have to use a solvent like DMF or DMSO. So in the way we dissolve them, it's not going to be soluble in water. But yeah, they are salts, but they are only soluble in certain solvents, like polar aprotic solvents. So you can safely put them on roofs and they're not... Yeah, so they're basically the... No, no, no. no way, yeah. well, I mean, they're going to be fully sealed before. Like those modules I showed are fully engineered to be completely sealed. Um, yeah, so it's like silicon, everything is shut off and there's no, no issue with, um, uh, with that at all, with water. And is that, yeah. does that, that make them more expensive? Uh, right. Nothing, no. I mean, with, given the advances in technology with silicon, it's so cheap now that they can just be implemented through the perovskite community. And actually, Oxford PV are doing a lot of very interesting stuff by coupling silicon with perovskite. So, yeah, it's, solar is very cheap. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Sue? So it's more generic questions because so, so solar cells have been mostly silicon, uh, fairly common material coming from sand. Uh, and part of uh, sustainable uh, problems is as well to think about the material we use. Can you comment on the commonality of perovskites and the material you use? The method we use? The, how common they are. So is it easy to find or will we have a problem of shortage? Or no, so, like yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of sand, right? So silicon is, is yeah. produced. Um, <laughs> so with, with the perovskites, we are using a range of materials like lead iodide, which for sure there isn't a shortage of. But the best thing about this is that we can actually recycle this very easily. So you can take the lead from lead acid batteries and reuse it in these perovskite systems. You can then take your cells and then recycle your um, old cells to make new cells again. So it's, there's been a lot of papers on the um, life cycle analysis of this and show that it's very effective uh, to be reused, which is great for sustainability. So yeah, it's, there's no issues uh, as far as I'm aware for that. <laughs>